Welcome back to our Ask the CIO webinar sponsored by Forge Rock. My guest for this segment is Ben Goodman, the Senior Vice President for Global Business and Corporate Development at Forge Rock. Ben, thanks for taking the time. Thanks so much for having me. We just heard Mike Sorrento from DMDC talk a lot about their future, where they're going with authentication, with, with identity and access control management. So let's start with authentication and DoD. We've seen it. It's been a journey. DoD has been out in front of so many agencies, and they're starting to consider, okay, where are we going next? What's the future look like? Walk me through that evolution a little bit of authentication, identity management across DoD, and, and how's, what did you learn from Mike's discussion? Well, I think in general, DOD, like you said, was out ahead. They recognized very early on that usernames and passwords aren't a secure way of authenticating. And you know, you see as, as early as the late 90s where they start really leaning in on PKI. Um, we obviously see HSPD 12, which is a huge um, kind of, you know, not just in DOD, not just even in government, but really was kind of game changing across all of IT because they created enough critical mass for people to really consider um, other methods of authentication, stronger methods of authentication. And obviously um, they leaned in on PKI and smart cards, but I think, you know, when, when the US government and specifically the DOD puts their weight behind something as important as eliminating usernames and passwords, everybody else kind of takes note to a, certain, to a certain extent. So that was a big step. And then I think what they've done in terms of trying to br bridge physical and digital authentication, what they've done in terms of uh, really focusing on credentialing to make sure that you have a really strong root of identity at the heart of everything. I think it really is a, an amazing best practice. I think the most difficult thing is, you know, uh, there's not enough uniformity in terms of applications that can consume PKI. And so I think at, moving forward, ensuring that you can use standards, and when I say standards, I mean open standards, not government standards, uh, open standards like OpenID Connect and OAuth and other ways to kind of bridge that gap between that strong authentication via PKI and what different applications and services can really support. And that's what's really going to support a lot of the DOD's requirements around federation, which are, you know, probably some of the most severe um, federation examples in the world, right, where you have to be able to federate with fellow warfighters and other things like that, right? You brought up this idea of PKI. I remember talking about it in the you know mid two thousands. What's the killer app for PKI? When are we going to get there? And there always needs to be a killer app for something. And what's interesting to me is it's almost like the pandemic was that killer app for stuff like e signatures, and that's where a lot of digital authentication started to grow. So DoD went through PKI. They moved to the Common Access Card. Now they seem to be moving toward this dynamic access. How does that work? How, how, when you heard Mike Sorrento from DMDC describe it, how does it fit into maybe what you're seeing more broadly? Yeah, it's, it's great. So first of all, it's funny what you say around the pandemic being a killer app. I think, you know, I, I was just talking with someone earlier today where I was saying, you know, could you imagine if this had happened 20 years earlier, right? And we didn't have access to do what we're doing now, you know, be virtual. We didn't have strong authentication. We didn't have so many of these resources we have today, I mean, our economy would have been shambles, right? I mean, even even more so as a shambles. And so I think it's, it's really um, amazing to see how technology is really driving our recovery from this situation. Um, around dynamic access, I was really excited um, around about that part of the conversation that you guys had. I thought it was really, really interesting. I thought Mike was really astute um, in the way he talked about it. You know, we have had this habit of saying, we're going to authenticate you once. And that authentication is gonna give you access to what you need. But what he talked about was this concept of really continu continuously authenticating a user. And by the way, all of the authentication doesn't, have, doesn't mean the user logging in, right? I may be transparently authenticating the user behind the scenes. And looking at what that user is trying to access, understanding access rights. So Mike really focused around, you know, dynamically looking at what access rights a user has. But I'd argue you actually want to get even more dynamic than that. Let's look at what device the user is on. Let's look at the contextual information, what network they're on, where they're physically located, what's the time of day, because that contextual information may actually play, um, may give me input into that access decision in runtime. So I may determine that two people accessing the same resource, but at different times and different places and different locations on different devices may actually get different access decisions. 
the other thing that may happen is maybe we introduce other forms of friction, other forms of credential recertification, other things that we do based on the contextual information and what you're trying to access. And so I think this concept of authentication being binary, that you're either in or you're out, I think is going to change pretty dramatically over the next couple of years where people are going to say, yes, I've authenticated you, but how confident am I that you are who you say you are? We've been talking about this idea of confidence and, and roles based uh, attribution authentication for such a long time. And I think one of the reasons why I think agencies are more serious about it or more able to do it these days is the move to the cloud is the development of microservices that they can do. Hey, we're just gonna add this microservice to this application that's gonna require, as you just said, a different, a, a different type of authentication. So it's not so binary. Are you starting to see uh, the cloud as the major, a major driving factor for agencies to rethink authentication and, uh, and identity management? Well, you, you touched on something really good when you talked about microservices. You know, microservices or cloud native applications, what's so powerful about them is that it takes these big, large applications and it breaks them up into smaller uh, bite-sized parts, if you will. And that allows me to potentially do fire, finer grained authorization. And it's really hard sometimes to do fine grained authorization inside of some massive application because sometimes the application just doesn't support that level of granularity. And so when I start moving to microservices and I have now have the ability to, to take smaller kind of atomic capabilities, atomic services and manage access to them, it really gives you much more control. And so I think microservices as a fundamental underlying technology are going to allow us to secure, uh, be more secure and be more dynamic about how we do authorization in the long run. Now, now, just to be clear, they're not necessarily a prerequisite because let's let's understand that microservices are, are certainly a newer technology that are still, you know, don't have mass ad adoption yet. And so you don't need to get to microservices to get to fine grain authorization, but it definitely helps. And I think as agencies live in a hybrid cloud world too, that's also gonna, part of the reason why it's gonna take some time and it's not the only way to do it. Another, you know, if you have on-premise and cloud, you need something that can kind of straddle both and be integrated across different data centers. And it's funny, you hear people talk about going to the cloud like it's a like it's a destination, right? And you're either and you're either there or you're not there. Are you in the cloud or you're not in the cloud? The the reality is it doesn't work that way. It's much more of a dimmer switch than a light switch. And people have cloud first strategies, they have uh, goals to be to have more of their services run in the cloud for better flexibility or for better time to value. But in some cases, they're going to be applications and services which are going to live on premises or they're going to live in a data center. And what's important to understand is that you really need technology that can bridge between the two. It can't be, so once again, so binary of you're in the cloud or you're out of the cloud. And, and so especially when you talk about what, what we were just talking about, this capability to extend authorization throughout an organization in a fine grained way, you have to be able to do that to your legacy applications, to your on-premises applications, to your applications that there's no good business case to move it into the cloud. And so I, th I think what um, with different people in the federal government, outside the federal government, inside of different government agencies really have to think about is how do they, how are they going to address the full spectrum of requirements when it comes to identity management and access management and, and a, hybrid a hybrid approach is gonna be here um, much longer than any of us expect. You know, our, our grandchildren are still gonna be working with on-premises applications, right? You just heard a big sigh from across the federal community when you said that <laughs> our grandchildren will be working with on-premise applications. Ben, one of the things you, you said here is agencies have to think about it. What are some of those things they do need to keep in mind when you sit down and talk to your federal customers What's the type of questions they're asking? What's the, what are their pain points around, hey, how do we integrate our identity management access control system or software or whatever they're using between our cloud and our our, our on-prem applications? Yeah, so first of all, the question is, you know, can I get can I get there from here? Right? Can I what can I what services can I run on the cloud? Um, and when I put something in the cloud, 
does it preclude me from still being able to access this other system that may be on-prem that may be you know, decades old or may be new, but just needs to be on-prem for regulatory reasons or whatever it may be. And so you know, the question is, you know, can I support both? If I go to the cloud, am I all in or, or, or can I move between the two? And so we wanna make it very clear that you can and that there's not a single technology that you can implement. It's not like you can just say, hey, you know, implement this standard, implement this technology, and suddenly hybrid's going to work. You really have to have a tool. You have to have a tool belt available to you of that consists of uh, different standards, different uh, technologies, different capabilities, and you have to be able to work together with them in order to address this. And to a certain degree, you can't be religious about it. Um, you know, people get religious about, hey, this standard's better than that standard, or this technology is better than that technology. You really have to be open-minded about working across the entire spectrum and, and, uh, and, and having a, a, that kind of Swiss army knife available to you to integrate with all these different services across on-prem, uh, hybrid, full cloud, um, cloud native, all of these components. And the reason for that is because it was what you said, agencies are gonna live in a hybrid world for quite a while and they need the ability to, to go back and forth between the two. Are you starting to see agencies, are they saying, okay, let's move only into the cloud and then we'll move on-prem? Are they, are they doing that integration? Are they only on-prem? Because, well, we have this HSPD 12 card. We have a lot of the infrastructure built up already. Why don't we start there and then worry about the cloud? What's, what kind of trends are you seeing around the move towards a more, I'll use your word, dynamic authentication? Yeah, so what we've seen a lot is people take a specific use case or a specific project and say, we're gonna to attempt to do that in the cloud. Um, and then what they, what they often find is, okay, we thought this, this project was isolated so we could do it in the cloud, but oh, we just figured out that it needs access to this system or this data, which by the way is on-premises. And so you end up with, that's how you end up with these hybrid applications and services where you know, por portions of them are running in the cloud, but maybe they need access to data that is on-prem or maybe they need um, to authenticate in a way which looks at a, a physical network or whatever it may be. And so having that, that toolkit of being able to say, okay, um, I'm starting in the cloud, but I need to reach out to this service on-prem or I need to reach out to this partner service uh, being able to use federation technology, being able to mix traditional client server with microservices, you know, that type of capability, that type of flexibility is going to be required to get the best out of the cloud and do it in a cost effective way. And I think that's the key here is the cost effectiveness, because for so long, HSPD 12, getting two factor authentication put in, people always pointed to the cost. Oh, it's just too expensive. We can't do it. We don't know how to do it. And then Boom, the OPM hack happened. And what did OMB say? No, you're going to do this and you're going to do this now. Again, that killer app, unfortunately, that sense of urgency happened. So I guess the question then becomes, okay, how do you ensure that you have good user experience because you have to get this done? There is that sense of urgency with the pandemic, but you also can't alienate your users who go, this is just too hard to deal with. It's a great point. You know, there's traditionally been this thought process that, a quality digital experience and a secure digital experience were mutually exclusive. You either had to be easy to use or secure. The two things didn't go together. And, and we argue that that's no longer the case. You're, not def you're no longer defying the laws of physics by providing a good user experience that is also secure. And, and there's a couple of different things that I think are, are setting that up. The first is the power of those devices we have in our pocket, right? So, you know, smartphones now have secure enclaves. They have um, biometric authentication built into them. They have the capability to do derived credentials. They have all of these capabilities that can fit in your pocket that we could have only dreamed about, right, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And, um, you know, I, I think about talking to a, a, a customer. Um, it was a state customer, not a federal customer, um, but who was talking about implementing uh, fingerprint readers in the early 2000s. And it was like science fiction, right? And now people authenticate with, with facial recognition and, and thumbprints 50 times a day without ever thinking about it, right? And so we've reached a critical mass that we need to be able to strongly authenticate people. We've also have real standards and technologies that allow us to then do a passwordless authentication um, from 
a smartphone or from a, a, an external device and do an, an out of band authentication. And those actually provide really good user experiences, arguably much better user experiences than entering in and trying to remember a password. And so this allows us to actually do a more secure experience because we're eliminating usernames and passwords from, the, um, from the, the user experience, but also one that's easier, smoother, cleaner. And then if we add some of the other things we talked about, like the dynamic authentication that allows us to evaluate contextual information and decide if there are certain situations where I should introduce additional friction to the user, I can do it only when necessary. And I feel more comfortable giving the user the access they need because I can recognize when there's risk associated with it and, and adjust appropriately. I really do wish we get to the point where we can uh, get rid of the passwords. A former cyber czar in the White House, uh, Michael Daniel, you know, made the announcement, I want to kill the passwords dead. And yet here we are, probably three, four, five years since his announcement still going. What was that username and password that I had? It'd be, it, yes, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of, of trying to get uh, done with it. Ben, this has been a fun conversation. Uh, we're just about out of time. So I just did want to let you know about, uh, ask you about what's the future look like? Identity management, we've talked about PKI. We've talked about uh, HSPD 12 common access cards. Now we're talking about dynamic and, and contextual information. Is, is If we talk again in three, four, five years from now, what's the next thing that agencies and vendors really should be looking at and keeping in mind? I mean, we've talked about you know, going from username and password based login to kind of multi-factor authentication to strong authentication, you know, can we get to zero login? You know, can we get to a situation where we're gathering enough contextual information about a person that we may feel secure to give that user some level of access without prompting them for authentication at all? Right. So you're on a device we, we recognize if you're you're this is the time that you always log in on the network. You always log in the way you're holding your phone, the way you're positioned in front of the camera, whatever it may be. Those combination of things give us a certain level of security. Maybe we're not going to let you into Cipernet with that, but but we may allow you to do to do your, um, you know, your benefits enrollment or something like that. I think we can get to a point where we can have confidence. In, in allowing people to do certain things without having to engage them in things that slow them down. And, and that I believe will fundamentally allow us to interject more security into the experience. And I think it's not, security won't be, an authentication won't be a single act. It'll be everything that you do. It'll be the way you interact with an application, the way you interact with the computer. And as if that changes unexpectedly, then I can say, hold on, this doesn't seem like you, let me ask you for something else. And so I really think, the amount of information we're able to gather about a user now from the different sensors and, and, and capabilities that they're interacting with are really getting to that where it's not science fiction, where it's, it, it is reality. Um, and so I'm excited about getting to, you know, forget about multi-factor authentication. I'm looking forward to zero factor authentication. Um, so. All right. Excellent. I look forward to it too. It'd be nice uh, to uh, have one, get rid of my usernames and passwords but more importantly, have security built in where it's just not a, oh God, uh, I have to do this again. It's almost like when you go to the gas station, now you put your credit card in, they ask you for your zip code. You just added a second factor without even thinking about it because it was mm -hmm. easy. And that's, that's what we all want is easy and security. But Ben, I know we could talk longer, but that's all the time we have for today. So let me thank my guest. Ben Goodman is the Senior Vice President for Global Business and Corporate Development at Fordrock. Ben, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much. It was great.